So welcome everybody to this uh, workshop on a systems approach in eco-design and energy labeling with as a subtitle how to make the political ambition a reality. Um, as I said, we have a nice uh, mix of, of people in the audience today. Um, we also uh, target a very, very lively debate and discussion uh, on this topic afterwards. So please uh, use uh, the, the, the Zoom features the Q&A pod to, uh, to join the, the discussion later on. My name is Dieter de Busser. I work as a program manager for the European Copper Institute. Uh, and one of my focus areas there is the eco-design and energy labeling. Um, I believe I'll be your host, host for today. Um, many thanks also to the people uh, from ECEEE uh, and to the Niels Borg and his, and his team uh, to support us with this event. It's set up as a side event to the ECEEE summer study that took place last week and where many related topics to uh, the one of today were discussed as well. Okay, as a short context and introduction to this workshop, um, why? do we have this workshop as you probably know this is a very uh, famous chart uh, already it shows the distance uh, in 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 uh, energy uh, efficiency to the 2020 and 2030 uh, targets and as you all know um, these are the, the latest figures from 2019 uh, europe is not really on track to meet the energy efficiency targets um there is for 2030, a gap of about 224 megaton oil equivalents. Uh, why I give you this number? Because uh, it is a bit the same order of magnitude of what we once identified as the overall potential of regulating systems. Uh, you see there the number of 290 megaton oil equivalent by 2030. This number originates from a workshop on systems approach that we uh, organized a few years ago and where uh, Paul Wade from uh, Wade uh, Strategic Advice, he um, calculated, okay, um, it, it was a kind of a approach uh, on, on, on what um, savings can be expected from regulating systems um, on top of, of components. Um, so this is an estimation, of course, uh, to give you an idea, uh, the underlying systems regulated, uh, some examples like motors uh, could save uh, another 72 megaton oil, oil equivalent. So I mean motor systems, of course. Lighting systems could save, the regulation of, of lighting systems could save another uh, 19 megaton oil equivalents. And then there's the, the famous lot uh, number eight of cables, which is uh, six megaton oil equivalents. Um, and to put it in perspective, the uh, commission itself uh, reports about a uh, 230 megaton oil equ equivalent uh, saving potential of the eco-design regulation as such. So basic message behind this slide is by regulating systems, we could have, or we could kind of double the savings potential of the um, actual eco-design regulation. But there's not only the saving potential, there's also uh, the fact that many political actors already have expressed the need to thinking beyond products. And I, I only list a few important ones. You of course have the, the MERP methodology itself. Uh, which in, in one of the tasks advised to look for opportunities at systems level, uh, starting from the components uh, going up to the functional uh, system. But then there's also this uh, technical report uh, commissioned by the European Commission. Uh, I think it was an, an ECOFIS report in 2014 that also recommends uh, to look at energy saving potential of product systems. And then the Parliament, uh, both the research service of the Parliament in, in its impact assessment of the eco-design implementation and also the own initiative report by the ENVI committee at the Parliament, they both urged the Commission to include more system level opportunities. So there is this big potential on the one hand, there is uh, certainly political will and, and political attention to do something. Uh, on the other hand, we see that um, nothing or not much has happened already in in uh, in real regulation that uh, that has come into into place, and uh, Fiona will will elaborate on that later on. And why is that? And I quote here uh, an, a member of the Commission at, at at one of the of the workshops uh, in, in in the past. Um, 
okay, we all know there is a big potential. Uh, it's not that easy, of course, uh, to, to regulate systems. And if it were easy, we would have done it already. And on the other hand, and now I quote a colleague of mine, Bruno, who wrote an, uh, an, a nice white paper on systems. Um, and, and he says, okay, but complexities are not a part of the approach towards regulating them, but they're just inherent to each system. And uh, if you ignore them, it also comes at a cost. So it's also about where you uh, make the choice. A focus for today's discussion. Um, in the discussion of systems, yeah, and a much heard argument is, okay, is eco-design and energy labeling or any product-related regulation, is that the place to look at systems? Uh, shouldn't we look at EPBD, Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, uh, or, or the EED, the Energy Efficiency Directive? Well, my invitation for today would be, uh, let's focus on what is possible from the product or the component up to the system. Um, and I don't know if, if you know this uh, De Bono uh, six thinking hats uh, methodology. Um, put, put all your yellow hat on, which means that look at this as an opportunity and, and look at where we think the opportunities and the possibilities are rather than, than listing the barriers, uh, because I think the barriers are, are known. So let's, let's uh, go creative um, and constructive. For today, um, I will soon hand over to Fiona Brocklehurst, uh, who will present a review of uh, the system approaches in eco-design and energy labeling. Uh, very, very nice study. The link to the study will be also posted in the chat window uh, again, so that you will uh, have the opportunity to look at it after it. Um, after Fiona, Hans Paul Siderius from the Netherlands Enterprise Agency will share uh, some insights of a very nice um, study that um, he did on transforming product efficiency policy into system efficiency policy. And then we invite uh, the people from the Commission, Ronald Pierde Raveschot from uh, DG Ender, who will uh, share their views with us. And then we also have a, a case study uh, presented by Michael Koenen from Europump uh, to see how systems approach can work. And very important for today is the discussion, of course, at uh, half past 11. We hope to enter into the discussion and I already invite you to write down your questions during the presentation so that we can uh, have a, a good and lively debate. And around noon, we should be able to adjourn. Let me first introduce uh, Fiona to the to the to the audience. Um, Fiona is an independent consultant with significant experience in renewable energy and energy efficiency, and she has provided expert support to many government departments and international organizations on environmental policy, and in the last decade, mostly relating to energy using products. So that's why we asked her to do this review study because she's very well skilled in the matter. Um, Fiona. I'm very curious to hear your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Judith. Um, so yes, I'll be describing um, briefly the piece of work I did for ECI. Um, started in November last year and completed March this year. Um, as Judith said, the, the, the link to the report will be available and I've got it on a slide. So if you want to get more detail, that's the place to go. Next slide, please. So I'm going to briefly talk about the differences between systems and products, just to set the context, describe the two operational regulations that are out there, and then talk through very quickly the, the studies that have been done to date that I reviewed. Um, then looking at the findings from the studies, um, what were identified as being the advantages of taking a systems approach and some common issues um, that are barriers to that and possible solutions. And then finally, um, sort of open up the floor for our discussion later on what possible ways forward there might be. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> these all will be familiar to our audience, I'm sure, but um, just to sort of set the ground rules, products are sold individually, systems are assembled or installed. Um, products are mass produced, a system could be relatively standard or it could be completely unique. 
Um, both of them need for energy performance, they need measurement standards or in, in the meantime, a transition methodology. Um, but generally those are available for products and they're less commonly available for systems. Products, generally the performance can be measured in a lab, um, but that's not the case for systems. They need to be either measured in situ or modeled. And there is a shift in terms of the responsibility a manufacturer or supplier has clear responsibility for a product. Um, and for a system an installer or designer has responsibility. So next slide, please. To date, um, there are only two products who have a true systems approach, I would argue, the heater and water heater package energy labels, and that is a water heater package energy label. Um, they were intended to encourage the combination of solar and conventional water heaters and temperature controls with conventional boilers. Um, the regulations were adopted in 2013 and came into force in 2015. Um, there's quite a lot of information about these because there was a um, the introduction was supported by a Horizon 2020 project called Label Pack A+. Um, they were also, space heaters were included in a Horizon 2020 market surveillance project, e -Pliant 1. The labels weren't actually part of the market surveillance, but there was a survey of installers about them. Um, and since then, they've been included in the coverage of review studies and um, uh, technical support studies, which are still ongoing. So going from that to another eight sort of studies that are reviewed, which haven't so far resulted in regulation. Next slide, please. So we have um, walking cold rooms, which were considered in the professional refrigeration um, working group, but weren't part of the regulations that were adopted in 2015. They are being considered in the review study, which is running this year. Then slightly differently, um, this is the only one that wasn't an eco-design study, JRC looked at come deriving a methodology for designing heating systems, domestic heating systems, um, to, take, to provide an energy efficient solution. Um, so that was one. Next slide, please. Then we have lighting systems. Um, it was completed in 2017 and since then a new set of lighting eco-design regulations has come in in 2019, but that didn't include anything about lighting systems or controls. Um, then we have slightly differently a point system um, which was looking at for more complex systems, is there a way of taking into account performance in different areas and coming up with an overall score? Um, and that took as its case studies, machine tools and data storage. Um, next slide, please. Um, pumps, the review study, which was completed in 2018, suggested an extended product approach was the best way forward. Um, uh, Michael Kernan is going to be talking more about pumps later. Then we have solar photovoltaics, um, the preparatory study finished a couple of years ago. That didn't, that suggested eco-design measures for the components, but possibly taking an energy label package approach for packages that were supplied to domestic, um, to households. Next slide, please. Then we have building automation and control systems, um, which as far as I know, hasn't completed. Perhaps someone on the uh, involved in the workshop can give us an update on what's happening with that one. Um, and then a few, quite a few years ago, the power cables study, which I didn't include in my review, but um, there's a separate study about that, and I bring a defector, and I took the findings from that into my overall review. So those are what I looked at. Um, next slide, please. 
there are quite a range of different products, different applications, different scales. Um, are there some common threads that we can pull out? And I think the answer is yes, we can. Um, starting off with the advantages. Next slide, please. As um, Dido mentioned, the reason that um, we're more everyone's interested in this is it's recognised that there is scope for a lot of say extra additional savings from systems um, on top of product aspects. Um, the relatively few of the studies I reviewed actually identified savings for the system approach separate from the product approach. Those that did found that there were substantial extra savings. Next slide, please. Other advantages that the, um, the studies found were in three cases, um, lighting systems, backs and pumps, there's industry support from the industry association, um, which will be always helpful in bringing forward regulation and then making sure it's effective. Um, two of the studies on the existing water label and the PV um, label felt that this would enable member state grant schemes or loans or other incentives to bring forward the best performing products. Um, a number of studies that looked at using other methods such as EPBD and Energy Efficiency Director EED um, noted that if going that route, those would be customized to individual member states, whereas an eco design and energy labeling approach is consistent across the EU and therefore may ensure more, more stringent um, applications potentially and more definite savings. Um, and then finally, one of the studies, the cable study, um, identified that there might be an increase in employment, more jobs from um, taking this approach. Um, next slide, please. But <laughs> the, if it was easy, we would have done it side of things. So I found quite a number of common issues that were identified in the studies. Um, some of them, some of the studies did identify possible solutions. But largely, these are my suggestions, which I'm putting forward as very much as speculation, as um, up for discussion. I'm absolutely not suggesting that these are easy things to do, but just trying to find but there are potential ways forward. Um, so we've already talked a couple of times about um, measurement uh, standards and a couple of the studies were able to make use of things where, where system standards are already existing, um, such as backs and lighting systems. And a couple of the studies in response to a commission mandate, um, since the studies were finished, they are now system standards available. So there were um, pumps and walking cauldrons. So I think it's just, you know, the earlier you identify that you need a standard and start that work, the better, so that that's then in place when you're trying to regulate. Um, several of the studies identified that you need to have a, a methodology or a tool to calculate the system efficiency that's transparent and consistent. Um, that doesn't need to be something necessarily very complicated. It could be a simple spreadsheet, um, but it is important to have that there. So again, if that's not already available, that needs to be developed probably as part of the preparatory study. So it's in place when regulation is, is ready to go ahead. But you can have a great methodology, but if you don't have the data to put in it, um, that becomes a problem. And the uh, water heater energy package label review identified installers and designers found it quite difficult to find that data um, and it could be very time consuming so finding ways to to make that broadly available is an important step um, for some products that might be via EPRAL um, other suggestions was a member state database or trade associations having an industry database um, the Sustainable Products Initiative, part of that 
is being solicited as having a digital product passport. Um, and if those were widely available, then that would also address this issue. Next slide, please. So the PUMP study identified this issue, which I mentioned at the beginning of moving from the manufacturer of the supplier, having the responsibility for um, the product. Now they're used to doing that, not just for eco-design and energy labeling, so REACH and ROS, um, they have systems in place, um, but that moves to the installer and designer. Those are different types of companies and they're not experienced with doing this. So this could be an issue. Um, so one suggestion is to potentially have different business models. So you have say lighting as a service, and then it, it's a different relationship with the customer or possibly um, developing specialist insurance so that um, maybe smaller companies also are involved in this and they'd be covered and not vulnerable and be prepared to take this responsibility on. Next slide, please. So there are quite a few issues around market surveillance. Um, so I'm gonna go through those. The, the PAMP study um, did identify that the eco-design two different clauses in the Ecodesign Framework Directive actually left it open as to whether it was possible to go in and um, check compliance of the system in place. Um, but, and also some member states, when they were asked to think about it, said, oh, we don't think we have the right to go on somebody's premises to install it, to inspect an installation. So it would be necessary to check what the situation is on those and possibly to revise um, the regulations to allow that to happen. Then an, another issue is in conceptually, um, if you had a product such as a light bulb, you only have to test maybe up to three of them in the lab. But if you had, you might have thousands of lighting systems. So how do you manage that? growth in um, workload, which is already quite extensive for the market surveillance authorities. So possible ways of doing that might be grouping into standard types. So you test, you do surveillance of one or two types um, or using technical documentation, assuming the components are already tested, um, would that be sufficient or is modeling um, a way forward also? Next slide, please. Then there's an issue, I think this is also the pump study. In principle, um, if, a, if a product's on the market, it's reasonably simple to find out that they are. You can look on an online website, or you can go into a physical shop, and there it is, and it's for sale. Um, how do you know if a system has been installed um, one suggestion was to um, have a member state or again, trade association database of installations, which then the surveillance authorities could check. Um, and then in the uh, water heater and heater energy labeling, um, they realized that if they wanted to go back and check it was done properly, um, there was no obligation on either the householder who it was done for all the designer to, um, um, to keep hold of the energy labels. They might just have been thrown away. So how do you get around that? And there were various suggestions. Um, there is, again, the digital product passport would be one way around that potentially. And the, there's a digital building logbook being proposed under changes to the EPBD and the energy label could be stored in there. So that's another solution. Um, okay, so next slide, please. So we are at quite an interesting time. Um, there's a number of different regulations and directives um, in play. The energy, the eco-design and energy labeling working plan, um, the study has completed the commission has yet to publish its working plan. The study didn't include any um, system related 
um, suggestions, but the Commission could add those in. And as I've just described, quite a number of, uh, quite a number of preparatory studies which are completed, which suggest a systems approach which the Commission could still take forward. So um, I don't, uh, Ronald probably won't be in a position to tell us much about that, but it would be very interesting to know the Commission's thinking on that. Um, there is the Sustainable Products Initiative, which is much broader than energy related products and energy efficiency, but definitely incorporates those. So there are certainly some links, as I've suggested, between that would ways that that could support an energy systems approach. Um, and then finally, we have EPPD and EED um, going forward and a number of these groups, product groups, they, the systems could be regulated through that route. So um, that is a way that that would go. So I look forward to hearing everybody's views on that and uh, I'm sure it will be an interesting discussion. Thank you. Oh, and here's, here are the links to the reports. Our second speaker is Hans Paul Siderius. He works as an expert on product efficiency at the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. And that's the agency of the Netherlands Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate. And he's also the Dutch representative of the European Commission Eco Design Committee, the Energy Label Expert Group, and he's vice chair of the IEA Technology Collaboration Platform on Energy Efficient End Use Equipment, also known as 4E. Hans Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you, Diedert, for the nice introduction and uh, the opportunity to uh, very briefly uh, present something on transforming product efficiency policy into system efficiency policy, which is based on a more elaborate paper that uh, was presented at the ECEEE summer study uh, last week. In the next 10 minutes, you will see some things uh, and hear some things that also were touched upon by Fiona, uh, but maybe from a, a somewhat uh, different perspective. Next slide, please. Uh, to go to back to the basics, what do you need for energy efficiency measures? Uh, well, there is the scope. What do you want to regulate the addressees? Uh, efficiency metrics and requirements and test methods for verification and compliance. And all of these uh, play a role in uh, not only when you want to regulate products, but certainly uh, when systems are in play uh, and systems provide some specific challenges to these, uh, to these aspects. But first, let's see what is a system. Next slide, please. Because that is, uh, has been sometimes caused some confusion. Uh, so there I want to uh, pay some attention to this definition. A general definition of a system uh, could be summarized as it's an entity made of several parts, but that that does not bring us very much further in uh, the framework of eco-design and energy labeling because a household refrigerator is also an entity made of several parts. So for systems policy, uh, we need something that uh, really distinguishes systems from, uh, from products. And that is the simple fact that uh, systems consist of parts that need to be assembled at the location where the system is used. So they're not uh, assembled in a factory uh, like a washing machine or uh, a refrigerator or an electric motor, but they are assembled uh, on site. And then they are assembled and installed so that they can uh, function. Uh, next slide, please. Are, uh, the question then uh, has been asked, are systems including in eco-design and energy labeling? And if you press the button, Dietert, the uh, answer is yes, they are. So uh, you could question then, what is the problem? Well, we come to that. Uh, please uh, press again. Eco-design defines a product uh, 
as any good that has an impact on energy consumption. And please note that a good can consist of several physical units uh, that is very common, for instance, with television, you have the screen and maybe uh, some loudspeakers and uh, remote control. Uh, these are different physical units, but uh, belong to the television as placed on the market. Then indeed placing on the market is the important uh, factor uh, for a product. Uh, the product is produced in a factory and installed at the end user. And then uh, the other option within eco design and energy labeling is putting into service. And that is indeed where the system uh, gets into view uh, because parts as produced in a factory are assembled and installed on location at the end user and put into service. And the energy labeling regulation defines, uh, even has a specific definition of a system. Uh, and that uh, I think can, although not included in eco design, it uh, very well also uh, applies to, can be applied to, uh, to eco design. The, indeed, the characteristic is uh, the goods that are put together. Uh, you can distinguish a function that is uh, performed uh, on a location and uh, the energy efficiency can be determined. Next slide, please. So if that is a definition of systems, then uh, it is clear that there is a range of uh, systems and in the paper, in the EEEE paper that has been elaborated upon, but here you find the three uh, most important aspects uh, that say determine that classification, the impact of the assembly, the number of parts and the percentage of identical parts, and that will lead you to a, say a classification from one to five, where one are say the simple systems, like a fan plus a VSD plus a motor, uh, two and three are more, uh, are already a bit more complex like lighting systems and BECs. Uh, and then four uh, is uh, maybe not directly uh, complex, but certainly because the assembly has a large impact, uh, there is a large impact also, or a, um, a chance that, uh, yeah, that things go wrong with the assembly, walking coolers, freezers, and then five are the, you could say, the most complex. Next slide. Fiona already uh, talked about this. Uh, the main challenges I think is in assessing systems. How do you assess the energy, uh, the energy efficiency, uh, and uh, indeed in checking compliance, uh, practical aspects uh, like uh, do we know who the addressees are, uh, can we test on location, uh, what is, are the results reproducible and indeed the regulatory powers. So I won't uh, go much into that. Uh, next slide please. The paper also uh, indicates a couple of approaches in assessing systems. Uh, the black box is where you test the system like a product and that is very well possible with uh, say the uh, certainly a large number of uh, for instance fan VSD uh, motor combinations or uh, pump VSD motor combinations. These can be uh, many of these uh, it's more the size that is the pro that is an issue, but many of these can be tested like a product in, uh, in a lab. Then you have a modeler approach where you test the parts and combine the results, uh, for instance, with a spreadsheet as Fiona already indicated. And then some more, uh, say newer uh, procedural where you look more at uh, quality management, uh, statistically uh, where you monitor uh, the energy consumption and performance when the system is in use and modeling where you uh, derive uh, the important parameters from a mathematical model or a scale model. And 
in the next slide and you will get the presentations. Uh, so you will be able to read this uh, more in detail and have enough time to read it. Uh, this maps the uh, system classes as uh, distinguished earlier uh, with these main elements of uh, uh, the energy efficiency measures for systems. And then some recommendations and outlook in the last slide. Uh, estimate the savings potential. There have been some estimates, but uh, I think it's good that we uh, get indeed a good view on this. And there uh, may be a word of caution because many savings uh, that uh, are attributed to a system approach uh, may not be realized with eco-design uh, because eco-design and energy labeling in general cannot say mandate or force the sizing of the system, uh, which is of course an important uh, always an important consideration for uh, an efficient system. A too large system uh, will mean probably too large energy consumption, even if the system is uh, efficient. And where the assembly has a large impact, then indeed the assembler uh, must be included uh, as address C. Uh, and their kind of quality management approach could be, could be useful. Uh, but also uh, maybe a regulatory option to regulate standardization of the assembly could be useful. Uh, the EPPD, the quality approach in buildings was already uh, mentioned and that is a good uh, way uh, to uh, get inspiration and also the modeling uh, was used. So I think with this, uh, uh, I think I'm not very uh, far of the approaches uh, that uh, Fiona already sketched. And uh, thank you for your attention and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot, uh, Hans Paul. I really like the way you presented this, uh, let's say, categorization of, uh, of systems, which uh, at least makes it more simple to look at uh, this complex matter. And uh, also, uh, I, I like to point to a comment that Andre uh, Litiu has mentioned in the in the Q&A, and, and you also, uh, Hans Paul, mentioned the link with uh, Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. Uh, Andre points to this um, energy the set of EPB standards, uh, energy performance in buildings standards, with a with a link to this set of standards. So, during the discussion, we we can uh, see if we can dive into that as well. But uh, thanks, uh, Andre, also for uh, for adding this. Okay, then uh, we're ready for our third speaker. So. Welcome, uh, Ronald. Um, great to have you in the panel as well. Uh, for the people who don't know you, let me shortly introduce you. Ronald uh, Piers Dravenschot previously has been working at the Joint Research Center, JRC, where he was in charge of providing scientific support to several EU initiatives and projects in the field of energy and environment. And then back in 2017, he moved to DG Ener as policy officer dealing with eco design and energy labeling. And there is in charge of several product groups like electric motors, variable speed drives, and some of their applications. And uh, now I'm really looking forward, Ronald, to hearing your views and understandings of the challenges raised by systems approach. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dieter. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to give some views of, of let's say, um, the people uh, working in, in this topic. It's not official views of, of the commission, of course. I will not uh, present you an um, exhaustive uh, um, view of the work that we have done on system. And I think that it's very good that we had the presentation of, of Fiona before that really did that job and uh, that was excellent. Uh, also, I'm very pleased that um, the very interesting analysis done, done by Hans Paul is, so, is also very helpful. Um, Next slide, please. I, I would just wanted first to start uh, with a reminder, because indeed we, we, we I think we place ourselves very much in the context of what is eco and what can do, be done with eco design. And I want just to remind 
let's say the origin of eco design it has its roots in the article 114 of the treaty of the functioning of the european union um, and it's really about the functioning of the internal market and the free movement of goods that's let's say the global context and we are in the field of approximation and harmonization of law which means consistency of laws regulation and standards and practice so that the same rules will apply to businesses that operate in more than one member state so it's it's really to make sure that all businesses are uh, set to the same rules and is uh, the, the, the 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 framework is adopted through ordinary procedure meaning a legislative proposal from the commission and an adoption by the legislator the co-legislator which is a european parliament and the council and then that the, the the legislative act can foresee that the commission adopts implementing measures uh, and this is what we do through uh, eco design next slide please <clears throat> The consequence of this is that the rules have to be met when the uh, regulated product is placed on the EU market. It means when it is made available for the first time. And the blue guide says that the product, uh, in, uh, when it is made available, it should be already manufactured and that an offer or an agreement between the parties for the transfer of ownership should be there. And normally it's the EU manufacturer or the importer that are uh, responsible. Uh, but these conditions um, do not always apply, and this is why the putting into service uh, comes into play, as Hans Paul has already very well explained, and it's a different moment that um, the placing on the market, and the rules apply whatever comes first. If the product is placed on the market, then it's at this moment that the rules have to apply. If it is not placed on the market, then it's putting into service that, that other moment that applies. And for example, uh, putting into service would come into play when the end user buys components separately and put them uh, into service. Then he's the manufacturer and then he is responsible. Uh, he has some responsibilities according to EcoDesign. He must make a conformity assessment, a declaration of conformity, and a CE marking. Of course, an end user will not often be equipped for that. So most of the time, uh, probably an installer, as we already mentioned, would have to do that. Next slide, please. Uh, one question I, I asked myself when I was preparing this presentation, you know, what is the systems approach? What do we want to do? What, 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 what is our goal? Of course, we want to, you know, to, to, to generate more, more energy savings, but I think that there are different uh, meanings of a systems approach. And um, the first, let's say, uh, level, I would say, is to look at the efficiency of what we could call complex or extended products. For example, instead of looking at a pump at just hydraulic component, we, we, we look at the pump, the motor, the efficiency of the motor, the pump and the variable speed drive as one, uh, let's say product uh, or uh, extended product. Um, and uh, which is already a small system in itself. Then we go, could go to a further stage where we look how well that extended product is suited to the to the system with which it interacts for example um, is a fun properly sized and as Hans Polo already mentioned uh, this is much more difficult or not not really foreseen in other eco design and then really improve the efficiency and the design of the system with which the product interacts because the, the uh, uh, if, if we look at a pump or a fan it, it doesn't work in itself, in, in its isolation, it interacts with a system. How can we also uh, play on that interaction and the efficiency of the system that is beyond the product that we are regulating? And that's, of course, if we look at the scale from top to bottom, we are, um, let's say, getting increasing benefits, but increasing challenges and complexity, also, especially in, in the frame of, of eco design, which is not really suited for, for that. So I think this is where all the, the challenge lies. Next slide, please. Now, some EU experience that already, Fiona already mentioned one, uh, which is the one that is well known is the heating water heating package label uh, that is to be delivered by the installer who puts the components to, to, together and put the, the, the product uh, in service. And the, the feedback I got from the colleagues is that the experience is mitigated. Uh, of course, there are the difficulties of enforcement that we know. But um, also what a colleague tells me, tell me is that um, the, um, there is a problem that the, 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 the label is not really known by the public and 
often and sometimes not done by installers themselves. So that's, that was really an issue, but it was decided not to cancel it, to give it more time to succeed and to try to simplify it. And as, as I find I mentioned, uh, maybe through an IT tool or that would collect data from April, something like that to make it more simple for the installers. So let's say it's not, we don't have decisive conclusion. It's not fully negative, but it's not fully ne positive neither. So we are looking at, at solutions. So let's say the, the question of replicability is not, let's say fully, fully resolved. Solved. Next slide. Uh, a few words on what we are looking at for solar panels. Um, the impact assessment is ongoing and there would be a consultation forum in September. Um, for eco design, we are just looking at efficiency of the, povules, of the modules, the PV modules and the inverters. Uh, we also foresee an energy label that would be for the module and but also an installer level for the system which would include module inverter cabling uh, possibly shadows inclination orientation and that label would would have to be supplied with with an offer for a, for a for a pv system and some of the discussion points of course are around the enforcement difficulties uh, that we already mentioned and that will also be discussed uh, later uh, another question is the influence of the climate. Um, should uh, a system in Malta get a much more better score than a system in Sweden? Influence of orientation, you have a roof, you don't have the choice of orientation. Should you be, get a bad label for that if it's oriented into the north or not? These kind of questions um, arise. Next slide, please. In general, uh, I have listed here some of the challenges. Um, there will be some repeats from what have the previous speaker have said. I hope to bring maybe some, some different light. And I'm sorry, I don't have, let's say, the, the solutions that Fiona Aldo uh, proposed, but some of them surely would, would be, of course, of interest for, for investigating. Um, one of the big issues is that of the one well identified product manufacturer, the uh, responsible person is an installer who would put that extended product together. And this is a much broader range of actors and we need to identify them, to inform, to train, to survey them. And it's much more difficult because it's a diffuse, let's say range of actors. Um, they are not well represented. When, I, when we speak to monitor manufacturers, we have an association that represents a very large proportion of the market. These installers are not well represented. So if we want to, uh, let's say, uh, get their inputs, their views or uh, inform them, it's, it's much more difficult. Um, also, the fact that, uh, as we said, if each in installation is, is specific, each installation potentially should be verified by, by markets, and, uh, markets and authorities instead of just looking of one model and then you have um, millions of products or thousands of products that are placed on the market that um, you can withdraw. And uh, I think it would be very difficult to say that one installation would be representative of one other. So it's it's really a matter of resources. How can market science authorities really dedicate resources for that when it's already a big, big challenge at the simple product level? Uh, as already been mentioned, some MSA do not have the legal powers to visit the installations. And how can they be aware of the extent, uh, the existence of these installations? Very important, also well, very well introduced by Hans Paul. How to measure the um, efficiency on site? What is very important is that any method provides legal certainty. Um, if a market goes, goes and uh, makes some observation, they must be able to defend them on, on in front of a court. And manufacturer also has to, legal, to have legal certainty. He must be sure that if he do, does his job well, uh, the product will comply and that there was no uncertainty of what will be the humidity and the temperature that day where the market surveillance authority will come on site with influence the results. So it's, 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 it's very challenging. Next slide. Um, Yes, putting in, in very legal terms, putting it to service is taking place at a specific moment after which the requirements do not apply. And uh, in principle, the MSA should be present at that day to, to if they want to make sure that um, uh, the, um, the requirements are met. So it's, it's a, let's say, uh, another, another issue. Also, the consequence of non-compliance. Normally, uh, if a product is non-compliant, uh, you would withdraw it from the market. But if you have a product that is installed, can you remove it from the installation and stop the entire in industrial installation because the, pop, the pump is not compliant? That, that, really, that does not really seem to be feasible. So there would have to be a new arsenal of, of measures 
uh, to address uh, non-compliance. There's a specific legal barrier in the, in the in the eco design regulation that says that specific verification can be achieved directly on the product or on the basis of the technical documentations. And it was really raised by some market authorities that no, we cannot verify a product on site. Sorry, uh, it's not legally possible. Um, and also the, the multiplicity of actors in complex uh, projects. And that's um, the problem of the address that Hans Paul mentioned. Next slide, please. And here I, I recall, I mean, I was uh, before joining the commission, I was working in industrial company. Uh, we were uh, making more products for big uh, power plants. And there is a huge number of factors. There is a client, which not, is not necessarily the same of the end user. There may be, there is one general contractor that will have one or several uh, design office internal of external that will de design the system, a series of suppliers, a series of subcontractors, uh, maybe the one for electrical installation, mechanical installation, hydraulic part. Um, and uh, if there is a, something wrong, not working the system, who is responsible? I think it's, it's, it's I mean, it's also a complex, uh, complex uh, question. And we really need to find, make sure there is one addressee that is responsible and that um, otherwise it, 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 nobody, nobody will be, will be really big paying attention to the, uh, to the requirements. Um, next slide, please. I had the intention to present uh, the results of the review study of water pumps and what is our proposed approach, but I realized that Michael is going to do next, that next. So I, I don't think I will, I will do that. Maybe just a few, a few words. Um, I think we should also realize that even regulating project is not simple. Huh? Uh, it, it's not that simple. I mean, it may seem simple and we know how to do it and it works, but it's not simple. It really, I mean, we already have just for simple product, a lot of legal, technical implementation questions. So it's really not a, already a simple thing. It, it may seem simple because it works, but it's not, it's not simple. That's maybe one, one comment I wanted to say. And um, the other comment is that I think the products approach and a systems approach are not necessarily mutually exclusive. And this is, I think, how we would go in for, for example, water pumps, we would keep probably requirements on base shaft pumps to make sure that we, we still may continue to make efficient base shaft pumps, but then add another, let's say, layer for the extended products and make sure that the comp the comp to get all together the components are, are efficient and also can deliver um, benefits for the system that is beyond the pump unit. And that, that's the purpose of, of the view of the regulation. But the, this, this I will leave to, to Michael uh, to, to explain. Voila, this is, uh, I will stop here. I will not present the, the next slides. Uh, I think uh, I, I will leave it to, to Michael. Thank you. So uh, Michael, or should I say Michael Koenen, is an electrical engineer working for KSB since 2011. And in that role, he's also representing KSB in associations like Europump, but also CMAP, and in relevant standardization committees on a global level. He acts as a kind of liaison officer connecting the pump industry with motor and drive industry. So talking about systems, he's the man. <laughs> and he also brings together the needs of both sides by supporting a systems approach. Looking forward to your presentation, uh, Michael. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Didier, for, for this nice introduction and uh, the opportunity here to, to present the Europump's uh, view on, on energy saving using our extended product approach for, for water pumps. Um, next slide, please. So um, here in, in, in this little overview, you, you um, it becomes visible um, that it took some years and a big effort to, to settle the knowledge and, and fix the extended product approach uh, carried out by, by European pump manufacturers. Um, we, we start where we are lead with, with different approaches, um, as you see it here, and um, the extended product approach was, was born around uh, 2007. And um, from this uh, year on, um, Europump uh, pushes uh, the standardization and legal requirements um, step by step in, in, in this direction. And um, yeah. 
And previously, we may state that we were partly successful, but to gain an optimum in energy saving, it needs an additional step forward and uh, a leave of the actual procedure, um, which, which we have it today. And uh, that you, 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 you will see on, on, on the next slide. Here in this um, in this overview, you you, you see the, the main uh, components for um, for uh, for an uh, extended product or on, on on a water pump. It, it's a motor, it's a drive, and and, and a pump. And uh, the today's focus is more on a component level, so it's vertically orientated, and then also the legal, legal authorities are following the focus on on these components. Uh, it's um, in, in this example for motors and drives, it's, it's based on, on IE classes for the pump, it's based on, on an MEI and it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's based on, on, a, on a nominal load point uh, efficiency for products. It's just one special load point where the product has its best efficiency. And when you when when you go to this extended a uh, product level, you, you you have to keep uh, something something different in mind that that will I uh, explain on the on the on the next slides later on. Um, one 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 back please. So um, when you when you raise the bar um, from IE class to IE class and then for for pumps the MEI level and so on, it, it this ends up in today's view and in, in a dilemma. Um, you need more material, better material, and you put everything to, to these products and um, you have a, a lot of resources needed to, to raise this or to, 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 to be able to meet the requirements of, of higher classes to, to have the, the potential saving of, of a fraction of a percent. So that's, that's, um, that's quite important and to today's view. And, 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 and a normal way uh, starts from the motor to the driven equipment. And that's, that's the today's view. Um, so um, we uh, have the first standard is this 61800-9 standard, which uh, is um, connecting the motor and the drive volt and uh, creates an interface for a loss exchange between these components and get the possibility to connect other components as we do it with a and so next slide this what you see here is a, is a little a little diagram which is uh, representing the complete energy demand of an, of an application. And in our case, it's, for example, a pump. You, you, you put some, some energy to this, to, this, um, to this diagram, to this application. And the gray one is, is, is used for the motor. The, the yellow one is used for the, for, the, for the pump. And the blue one is ending up uh, doing the job and pumping liquid to wherever it's, it, it, it's needed. And when you um, have this vertical approach and raising the, the IE classes for a motor or the MEI level to, 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 to um, stricter, stricter requirements, it is, it, it's end up that the, the gray one and the yellow one is getting a bit smaller. So the impact on the complete energy demand of this uh, whole application is, is quite, quite, uh, quite, um, quite low. So and um, it, it's only possible to, to save a bit of energy. So um, when you start uh, talking about energy saving, we have uh, to have a closer look into the blue arrow and uh, that's the real energy demand of the application. And that you see on the next slide. On the next slide, you, you um, have the, the, the same, but here we um, split it up the, the blue one in the real hydraulic demand for the application and the red part. And here it's getting very interested. The red part is this part of energy which is getting wasted and which is not needed from the, from the application. And here we, we, we have the possible uh, big, big, um, can, can have a big influence on the complete energy demand. And for that, uh, um, it's important to, to know what, what, what you are doing there and to, um, to combine the best products to, to this extended product and to reduce this red part of the, of the diagram. 
And what does it mean when the red arrow is, is not present any longer? That means that uh, the energy which you put to your complete system, to your application, is exactly what the application need to do the job. So, and I hope this um, brings you in mind the difference between this energy save, saving thing and the energy demand thing for, for, for the application where the components are, uh, are working in. <clears throat> so um, when, you, when you eliminate the, the red part, we are talking about kilowatts with, which are possible uh, uh, to, to save here. Yeah and not about a, a, a little number of percents of, of losses which you can reduce by um, raising the, the IE class of a product or um, raising the, the MEI class of, of a pump. And this approach brings real savings which are a lot times bigger than the component-based approach. Next. So, here um, you have the real extended product approach. Um, we have to change the direction of seeing. Um, and we, we have to start from the driven machinery. In our case, it's the pump. And not from the motor or the, or the, or the frequency converter. So uh, to confuse the days uh, from the motor to the driven machinery, that's what we have to change when we want to be successful in saving energy. The demand of energy steers the conveying process, hence the characteristic curves of the components have to come in alignment. So that's what we are doing. This is the one and only way to pro a product will show an optimized energy consumption for a target application. So and then that, that, that is what we, we have to understand and to realize and that's what we have to make happen. Making the energy use and transparent, uh, if you use an application with specific load profile, which is harmonized and typical for the application where the product goes into. This is quite a tough job to define these load profiles, but I think we, we, we have to, to do that job and uh, to, to be able to, to save energy. Um, that's, that's quite important. Next slide, please. So um, this what, what 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 you see here is the is the this is a typical pump application. There is more than 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 just the motor, the drive, or the or the pump. There is piping, valves, and and, and everything. And um, it's very important that we leave the component level behind us and uh, start energy saving using the extended product approach. And um, when we want to, to generate the real energy saving, you have to, to have a deeper look uh, into the application and understand what's happening there. Uh, so when the pump is more than a component, it's part of a, of a big system. Uh, so that's, that's quite important. And um, so I come to an end and it's quite important that you don't save what is left after spending, you have to spend what is left after saving. So and that's, that's, that's quite important. Thank you.